Good morning, everybody. We um, are the small faithful few. My guess is we will see more in the next 10 minutes as folks are running slow today on this kind of gray morning. But thank you all for being here. This is our last class on creeds and confessions. We had Joanna Adams with us talking us through all those creeds and confessions that are in our book of order, our book of confessions. And then last week spent a long time talking about the brief statement of faith. This week, we have the honor of having Dr. Martha Morkish with us to talk a little bit about the new confession that's currently being written. Um, and I don't how a new confession of faith is made and adopted. I mean, what more do you want? Thank you. I was talking with friends last night, and I was telling them that this is what the class was, and I said, it's really kind of fascinating. I've never seen it done, and I don't even know where you start, much less how you finish. Um, so we're grateful to have you with us. Martha is a professor at Columbia Seminary. She was one of my professors and Emily's professors and now works alongside Rebecca Groover. So we're grateful for Columbia and the ways that they have shaped this church and all of us. So Martha, I'll hand it over. Well, thanks to Lucy and to Rebecca and to Emily and to Kevin, who was also one of my students. Um, and so I was just congratulating him on his new ordination. Hooray, hooray for you all and for him. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've taught uh, at Trinity several times in the past, but never in this room. So how beautiful. And thank you for welcoming me here, those of you who are online and those of you who, who are here in the room. So um, when it was Alan um, Spetnagel, I think, who uh, extended the invitation originally for me to do this session. And this was the title that he asked me to address. Um, and so what I'm going to do this morning is, building on what I think Joanna has done the past couple of weeks, I'm going to talk some about history. So some of this may feel like review, um, but what I'm wanting to get you to see is how we got to where we are in terms of a book of confessions, and then setting up for where we are at this particular moment, which is committed to and in the process of developing a new confession of faith. Um, but we're going to start with some history. How do we even get a book of confessions? Oh, and I should say, let me back up to give credit to my colleague, Charles Wiley, you will see him named here in the parentheses at the bottom, um, who also works with Rebecca in the Office of Advancement at Columbia. Um, Charles and I are both on this new committee to write a new confession. And as part of our first meeting back in the fall, um, Charles and I did a presentation. And so what you're seeing here is an adapted form of what Charles and I did with the committee itself um, back in the fall. And so I told him I would give him full credit. So now if he asks you, you can testify that I did give him credit. Okay. Um, and you know, I should say all of the mistakes are his and, um, and uh, so no. Um, so how did we get a book of confessions? That's the thing I want us to talk about first of all. Um, so a little bit of a timeline. Um, the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America um, came over from the Scots-Irish immigration, right, um, in the 17th, well, 17th, early 18th century, and brought with them the Westminster Confession of Faith. And you, as you see here, the Westminster Confession of Faith was written in 1646. This was a document that was written in England um, by a group of Scottish and English um, um, what divines, they call them, the Westminster divines, church leaders, who were intending um, and asked at the time to write a confession of faith and catechisms that would be able to be used for all of the churches in England and Scotland at the time. This was during the brief period of time when um, Oliver Cromwell was ruling. You remember that period of time uh, when there was not a monarchy uh, in England for that brief period of time. And so the Westminster Confession was written with the intention that it was going to govern all of the churches and be the statement of faith for all of the churches in England and Scotland. Well, that didn't actually ever happen because politics, but what did happen was that the Westminster Confession uh, became very important in the Church of Scotland which was the Presbyter remained the Presbyterian Church. And, um, and so the Westminster Confession replaced what had been the Confession of Faith in the Church of Scotland before, the Scots Confession, which you may have heard about in the um, history from Joanna the past couple of weeks. 
So all of this is to say, there's this thing called the Westminster Confession. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Okay, good. So there it is. And in 1646, it was written. And in 1729, in the U.S., it was adopted by the Presbyterian Church in the U.S. as the statement of faith that all ministers had to more or less agree to. And um, the language in 1729 was that all ministers had to declare a agreement with Westminster in all essential and necessary articles. Let me repeat that language. So, so all ministers at the point of ordination had to agree that the Westminster Confession of Faith um, was uh, appropriate interpretation of scripture in all essential and necessary articles. Okay, so that language uh, persists. And notice what that language is doing. It's saying that, um, that the basics in the big picture, overall, Westminster is uh, an accurate, faithful, fair confession of faith. And it's the only one that we need in terms of teaching in the church. Notice what it also does not say is that every single detail is necessary to be affirmed. Right? This is not the same thing as subscribing to the confession of faith in every single right detail. So what happens is that um, instead of a kind of subscription theory, you have a bigger picture affirmation of Westminster as the confession of faith. And um, in a few years later, 1789, you have this language in the ordination vow. So all ministers of word and sacrament, like Lucy, Tom, me, right, Kevin, um, yes, uh, right, if you were paying attention at Kevin's ordination, you might have heard language um, that Kevin affirmed about the Book of Confessions, but it was not this. This is what was affirmed starting in 1789. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the Confession of Faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith, of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? That was the language that all ministers um, and elders had to affirm at the point of ordination. Okay, so what, why is this important? This is important because it shows you that it was the Westminster Confession that was the only confession of the church from 1729, right? For a very long time. But what happened over the years is that, over the centuries really, um, was that people could scruple particular details. So again, look at that language again, right? Um, oh, it's not there, but the, but the language that I quoted to you about essential and necessary matters, right? What could happen is that a minister could have a scruple. That is to say, they could say, I do affirm that in essential and necessary matters, the Westminster uh, Confession is faithful, but I don't agree that this little section here is essential and necessary. So, for example, um, over time, there were more and more scruples that began to arise, and I have three of them listed here. Um, one is this one, on marriage and divorce. The original Westminster Confession had language that specifically stated that divorce was not um, acceptable, uh, that you could not be an ordained minister and, um, and divorce. But what you see here is uh, language that was eventually adopted um, and, in, and they revised the confession of faith to permit divorce. So you can see here, this is the language, right? Um, blah, 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 blah. A breach of that holy relation may occasion divorce. So remarriage after divorce, granted on grounds explicitly stated in scripture, may be sanctioned. Okay, that is to say, this newer language was adopted in the early part of the 20th century to permit divorce, right, because the older document had not um, permitted it in any circumstance. Another um, way in which uh, people began to raise concerns, scruples about the Westminster Confession was around scripture. So this is the um, more or less original language. Um, from the Westminster Confession says, the authority of the Holy Scripture, for which it ought to be believed and obeyed, dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, 
but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof, and therefore it is to be received because it is the word of God. So that language um, began to raise concerns for some people, again, particularly in the early 20th century, because it sounded as though maybe the authority of scripture was such that we could not disagree with any detail with regard to, for example, scientific, new scientific discoveries, right, or historical discoveries or so forth. And so the authority of scripture began to raise real concerns for people late 19th and early 20th centuries and wondering if this is sufficient language to really express how we understand scripture to work. Um, another issue, which you might have heard of this little issue of predestination um, began to raise concerns over the centuries for some people. So here's the language um, from the Westminster Confession. This is just straight up. By the decree of God, for the manifestation of his, that is God's glory, some men and angels, and I think they mean not just male type persons, but human beings there, men and angels, are predestinated unto everlasting life and others foreordained to everlasting death. This is um, what's known as double predestination. This is a form of predestination that we see also in the writings of John Calvin and um, was enshrined in the Westminster Confession of Faith as doctrine, as the most faithful way to interpret scripture and the thing that people needed to adhere to when they were teaching in the church. That began also to raise more and more concerns among people, again, particularly in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So Tom, when you were coming along, predestination, was that an, one of the issues that you had to scruple? Yeah. And so I, I'm gonna hand this to you. I wonder if you can just describe how this would have happened if you needed to scruple something like predestination. I don't know it was so much scruple, but uh, when we were, we were examined on the floor of Presbytery, in East Alabama Presbytery, and uh, we had uh, a gentleman who was the pastor at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Montgomery, Robert Strong, who wanted to nail us on any, any matter. He was a very strict constructionist in terms of the Westminster Confession. So we had to figure out how we were gonna, how we were gonna phrase it in a way that was acceptable to the Presbytery, not just to him, but to the Presbytery. But he, he had a major role in, in determining the direction in which the Presbytery went. Yeah. And so, um, can I just ask, would you say what year it was? That, you that was 1963. Yeah. So that's important to note. So, um, so Tom is, is describing the way that, remember, we're talking about from 1729 Still true in 1963, the Westminster Confession of Faith was the only confession of faith that was declared to be doctrine in the Presbyterian Church. And therefore, if you were going to be ordained, you had to find a way to make your peace with at least the essential and necessary parts of it, it said. Now, um, and predestination was increasingly one of those issues that people struggled with in the way that Westminster declared it. Now, I don't know if Joanna, did Joanna talk about predestination at all when you all were here? A little bit. So I'll just say, um, and I don't know if, if Tom uh, witnessed this, but there is a famous story that I've heard from a number of different sources that in the 19th century, and I think continuing into the 20th century, one way um, that people might respond to this question is as follows. And the way I've heard this, it happened in Alabama, but I don't know, um, that, that there was a young uh, minister who was being examined on the floor of Presbytery and was asked, by somebody, um, are you willing to be damned to hell for the glory of God? Because the implication of this line is that if you are among those who are foreordained to everlasting death, and if that is for the God's glory, then you ought to willingly identify, right, and be willing to say, yes, I am willing to be damned for the glory of God. And this um, clever young minister responded, I am not only willing to be damned for the glory of God, I am willing for this entire presbytery to be damned for the glory of God. <laughs> you know, and I think he got ordained. So, um, 
But the point is this, that, uh, that all throughout those over 200 years, right, like 250 years, the only confession of faith that was um, operative in the Presbyterian Church in the U.S. was Westminster. So what happened? So 1958, um, there was a movement to write a new confession. Now, just sideline, this was something that happened in the Northern Church. There was a, an unfortunate split that happened between the Northern and Southern Presbyterian churches in the 1860s over the issue of slavery. So I presume you all know that history, I'm just naming that. So from the 1860s until 1983, there were actually two different denominations, uh, the Southern one and the Northern one. But in the North, there was in 1958, a move to write a new confession of faith. And the committee that was constituted proposed that this should be an occasion not just to write a new confession, but to have an entire book of confessions. And so that's eventually what happened. But, I, but it's important to see how, how really radical this was. This had never been done before, right? There had never been a collection, a book of confessions. There had only ever been Westminster, and Westminster was periodically revised to try to reflect new times. But, but what was going to happen now was that you're going to get a whole dang book of confessions, of which Westminster is just one part. And so eventually, that's what happened. Between 1958 and 1967, that committee worked to write what became the Confession of 1967 um, in order to express the faith of the church in a new time and place. But they also collected these other confessions along the way the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed as the two ancient ecumenical confessions, the Scots Confession, which had been important in the Church of Scotland in the 16th century, and then these other ones, the Heidelberg, the Second Helvetic, and Barman, were added as um, confessions that had not been particularly central to the Presbyterian stream of Reformed theology, but had been important in other Reformed churches um, closely related to us. So we'll say more about that in a moment. But just look at the history. This is what I want you to notice. Um, that right from 1646, the, the writing of Westminster and the adopting of it in this country in 1729, up until 1967, there was only one confession, right? I just want you to notice what a striking, striking thing that is. And so in 1967, you get the Book of Confessions, and then in 1983, as we're going to see, in 1983, you have the reunion, finally, of the Northern and Southern churches, and then the whole Presbyterian Church in the USA has a Book of Confessions. But a little side note um, along the way. Um, in the old southern stream between 1967 and 1983, this is the period of time when I was growing up, so this is actually, I actually remember this history, and maybe Tom does too. Um, in the old PCUS, the PC, people were paying attention to what was going on in the northern church, and they were saying, hey, that seems like a really good idea. We need a new confession of faith too. Like, we only have Westminster, so maybe we need to introduce and develop a new confession of faith that actually speaks to this day, this time and place. Um, and that idea of uh, developing a whole book of confessions, that would actually be really useful. So what I hold in my hand is uh, the 1976 proposed book of confessions um, that came out in response to that same impulse, and it includes... Um, not just the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed and the Heidelberg Catechism and so forth, um, and Westminster. It also includes a document that was written in the 1970s called the Declaration of Faith. And the Declaration of Faith was written by people including Shirley Guthrie and Ben Klein, both of whom taught at uh, Columbia Seminary. And it was... Um, is and was a beautiful um, liturgically oriented statement of faith written for the church in the 1970s. Um, I'll pass this around in case you want to take a look at it, um, but the, the thing is that it was popular. Um, this declaration of faith that was written in 1976 was popular, used by, um, and still used actually, by some southern stream churches. Um, 
It was adopted by the General Assembly in 1976, but it was not ratified by enough Presbyteries, and therefore it was never fully adopted as a book of confessions for the Southern Stream. Now that's gonna be important when we talk about the process of adopting a book of confessions later, but that this is an example of a confession that was written, that was affirmed by very many churches, affirmed by a general assembly, but never fully adopted because it was not ratified by enough presbyteries. So, so we had to wait, we in this region of the country had to wait until 1983 when there was the reunion of the Northern and Southern churches, at which time um, the new denomination, the PCUSA, adopted the Book of Confessions. So um, let me pause there and just see, let me just pause and see if there's any questions about that, that much history before we move on. What I'm trying to, I was just trying to give you a kind of big picture survey first. Okay. Um, and then, in case you're interested, since 1983, so 1983, again, when the reunion happened, and we had now all the Presbyterian churches got this book of confessions, um, some things have continued to change. One is that we had the brief statement, which you and Joanna talked about last week, right? So the brief statement of faith was added. That was the confession that was written specifically to respond to the establishment of this new denomination, um, starting in 1983. So that was, the, that was added. There was a new translation of the Nicene Creed um, introduced in 1997. Uh, there was also a document which, and I'll pass this around in case you want to take a look, it's um, appended at the back of the book um, called The Confessional Nature of the Church, and that was adopted in 1997. It's not a confession itself, but it's a very helpful teaching document about what it means to be a confessional church. And so that was a document that was adopted by the General Assembly and is now included in um, editions of the Book of Confessions. There was also, um, in 2004, there was an important statement adopted um, placing the historical condemnations of the 16th and 17th centuries in context. And I want to show you um, that, that language just so you can see. It's a way of the church recognizing the historical context of some of those negative statements that were made in the Reformation era and saying that they were historically important, but that they do not apply to the way that we understand, for example, the Catholic Church today, right? And so here you can see, right, specific statements in the 16th and 17th century confessions and catechisms contain condemnations or derogatory characterizations of the Roman Catholic Church, and it lists all of these. But notice this, while these statements emerged from substantial doctrinal disputes, they reflect 16th and 17th century polemics. Their condemnations and characterizations of the Catholic Church are not the position of the Presbyterian Church USA now. And they do not apply to our relationship to the Catholic Church now. And so this also is important um, to, uh, to note that when we look at this book of confessions, we're not necessarily endorsing everything that all of those Reformation era documents say. But we're no longer in a position of trying to just simply remove them. We recognize them as historical documents. We're not trying to amend them to clean them up. We're trying to say, yes, we recognize that they're there, and we're gonna put an asterisk next to them, and we're gonna say that was important to our history, but it doesn't apply now. Does that make sense? So that too is important. Um, and then just a couple of other changes to the Book of Confessions since 1983, a new translation of the Heidelberg Catechism, and importantly, the addition of the Confession of Belhar. That's the most recent addition to our book. So if you look at that contemporary Book of Confessions, um, you'll see that added. Okay, so um, that was the history. Let me just um, show you what you doubtless have already talked about with, um, with Joanna, but just a reminder, these are the documents that are in the Book of Confessions. First of all, the creeds of the ecumenical church, the Nicene and the Apostles' Creed. And then this section um, that comes from the Reformation era, that is the 16th and 17th centuries, Scots, Heidelberg, Second Helvetic, and Westminster, those are all confessions that come from that pivotal historical era. And then the modern confessions, 
Barman, The Confession of 1967, and The Confession of Belhar. Um, and, oh, excuse me, and The Brief Statement of Faith. So even though uh, Belhar was added last, because it was actually written first, it was written earlier than The Brief Statement, so these are arranged in chronological order. That's why they're in that order. Um, now, I'm assuming that you all have talked already about all of these, and so I'm not going to spend time unless you flag me down. Any questions about what you're looking at here on the screen at this moment. Okay, so what I wanna turn to now is, this was all a setup for the real question, which is um, how and why and when do, do we write a new confession? So I wanted you to see, first of all, the way that historically, this is a pretty recent question, right? Writing a new confession did not happen from 1646 to 1960s, right? All of that period of time, we didn't write new confessions. We uh, amended Westminster, but we did not write new confessions. And so this is a relatively recent development in terms of the Presbyterian stream. But this is now what our Book of Order says. Um, the creeds and confessions of this church arose in response to particular circumstances within the history of God's people. They claim the truth of the gospel, at those points where their authors perceived that truth, that is the gospel, to be at risk. So this is the language that has emerged to say there really are moments in history when the church needs to stand up and say something about the faith now. And so that language of status confessionis, that's the, that's the um, Latin phrase, that basically just means uh, um, that the church is in a state of confession. It's in a moment when there needs to be a confession of faith made. Um, so when has that happened in the past? Well, we see that clearly in the 16th century, right? Um, many, many confessions emerged in Europe, in the churches, um, in the 16th century because there was such a perception that there had been a lot of um, abuse uh, in the churches, in the Roman Catholic Church. And so many, many confessions arose, including the Scots Confession, which we have in our book, the Heidelberg Catechism, which we also have in our book, the Second Helvetic Confession, Confession, which we also have in our book, and eventually the Westminster Confession. These are our examples. But all of those arose because there was the perception that we needed, we, the church, needed to state the faith in a way that was clear and compelling in this particular historical circumstance. So the 16th century saw um, a real uh, flourishing of those kinds of confessional writings. But then in 1967, um, the the church perceived again that, there, that we had reached another status confessionis. And what was the reason? Um, because uh, particularly here, this, this line here from the Confession of 1967, um, there was this perception that there were so many things going on in the world that the Westminster Confession simply wasn't addressing. It wasn't equipped to address. And we needed a new confession that spoke to, for example, racial discrimination, Peace, this was during the time of the uh, Vietnam War. Um, poverty, the increasing uh, recognition of um, dis economic disparity in this country. And the sexual revolution was going on, and, as well as the early feminist movement. And so, and so many issues were identified as needing the wisdom of the church. The, the church needed to speak um, to these issues in a way that Westminster just wasn't equipped to do. So all of that is simply to say that in 1967 and leading up to it, uh, there was the perception that there was a status confessionis. There was a moment that the church needed to speak to in a new way. Here's another example. More recently in South Africa, the Reformed churches in South Africa perceived that the apartheid um, movement, the apartheid um, laws, were simply against the gospel. 
And so the church needed to speak out. First of all, the uniting reformed church in Southern Africa, that was, uh, I believe they, they call it the colored church. You may remember, um, those of you who lived through that era, that um, under apartheid, South Africa had not only civil laws, but also the churches were divided by race. So there was a, established a reformed church that was really white, Afrikaner, a reformed church that was for black people, and a reformed church that was for so-called colored people. Those are people who are either of mixed race um, or of Indian descent. And so the churches, uh, first of all, the colored one and then the black one, adopted this statement that was written called the Confession of Belhar, speaking out explicitly against apartheid as a situation that was unfaithful to the Christian gospel. And so you see here these themes of unity and reconciliation and justice being the guiding themes of um, Belhar. And you see, for example, here, I'm, I'm looking at this uh, section on reconciliation. This is part of the language. It says, we reject any doctrine which in such a situation sanctions in the name of the gospel or of the will of God the forced separation of people on the grounds of race and color and thereby, in advance, obstructs and weakens the ministry and experience of reconciliation in Christ. So that was a statement that said uh, explicitly all of these laws that we have in the church and in society that are separating people according to race, those are against the gospel because the gospel is about reconciliation. So again, you have in Belhar um, a confession that arose because there was a seen to be the need for the church to speak out um, for the gospel. Yes? Eventually, the Afrikaner church also adopted this, but only after the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, the worldwide ecumenical body of Reformed Churches, had excommunicated the Afrikaner church because they continued to subscribe to apartheid. So there was a period of time when the worldwide, the global ecumenical reformed body declared that that Afrikaner church was basically um, ignoring the gospel and they were not going to be in full communion. So eventually, after some years, the Afrikaner church changed their ways and changed their policies and, and did adopt the Belhar Declaration. So all of that is to say, right, um, that, that there are part of the question that comes up when we're talking about confessions is when and why would you write a new confession? So we're going to return to that question in a moment. But here first, I want to show you um, the importance of, in our uh, constitutional documents, the, the importance of the confessions. Um, first of all, and this is the language that Kevin, who had to leave, um, had to say yes to uh, just last month, that Tom would have to say yes to today if he were ordained. This is the language that I actually did have to affirm when I was, um, when I was ordained in the year 2000. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets Notice that language of essential. We saw that language before, right? Do you remember that? All the way back in the 1729 language, essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of the church, now all the confessions, not just Westminster, as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do. And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? I'm showing you this just so you can see, and all of you who are elders have also said yes to this. Um, in other words, it's a way of saying that the confessions do have authority in terms of guiding, leading, teaching the church, and all who ordained pledge to be guided, right, by these. But notice, essential tenets does not specify, right, which essential tenets we're talking about. So there's room for discussion about what you regard as essential, and that's where sessions, churches, presbyteries, general assemblies have room for conversation, like what, what really is essential. Um, I'm going to be aware of our time here. What time is it? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to skip ahead just to say this. Um, this is just more language from our book of order to show you the way that the confessions are regarded, not as equivalent to scripture, but as subordinate standards um, under scripture. But here's the question. Okay. So here's, here's how 
a new confession gets developed. This is, this is the official process. Um, some council or governing body brings a recommendation to the General Assembly. Then the General Assembly recommends the writing of a new confession. And then a committee is formed um, and has to report regularly to the General Assembly until that committee then brings the new confession to another General Assembly. If it's approved, then the confession is sent to the Presbyteries for ratification, and if two-thirds of the Presbyteries ratify it, then the confession is adopted. So remember what I showed you with that proposed book of confessions over there. You know, Jim, you want to hold that up? The one in the, oh, the other one. Yeah, that one. That one um, reached this point, right? The committee brings a new confession to a General Assembly, and it was approved. That happened in 1976, um, and it was sent to Presbyteries for ratification, but this last step was never satisfied, which is why that proposed book of confessions remained just proposed. Um, but in other, uh, in other confessions that we've had, like the Confession of Belhar, like the Brief Statement of Faith, these are the steps that have been followed, right? And in, in all of the cases of the documents that we have in the Book of Confessions, they've all been ratified now by two-thirds of the presbyteries, and so they are included. So where are we right now? Um, in 2022, this action was taken by the General Assembly. The action to form a special committee to write a new confession to be considered for inclusion in the Book of Confessions. And this special committee shall be formed no later than, shall be formed, the committee, uh, shall be formed no later than December 31st of 2024. So that, um, that action was responding to these three actions that had been brought to the assembly. So remember, I told you that um, the, there has to be some council or governing body that brings the action to the General Assembly. The General Assembly doesn't just come up with it on their own. And so this is what uh, they were responding to in brief. There were three um, overtures that came to the General Assembly in 2022. This one came from the General Assembly Committee on Ecumenical and Interfaith Relations. That's a constituted committee that is um, that consists of people from around the country, churches around the country who are particularly focused on the work of ecumenical and interfaith stuff. And they brought to the General Assembly this concern about what they identified as racism and white supremacy in the nation as a distortion of and existential threat to the gospel and actual people's lives. So notice how that is, a, that is an identification of what is at stake, what is the status confessionis that led them to say we need a new confession. They were saying the, the, real, the, the recognition of racism and white supremacy in the U.S. is not sufficiently addressed at this point yet in the Book of Confessions, and we need a statement that will say something more explicitly about that. The Presbytery of Arkansas uh, also brought an action, an overture to the Book of, uh, excuse me, to the General Assembly. They were more interested in this overall question about theological anthropology. That is, what does it mean to be human? And they were really um, identifying a number of ways that human beings are being marginalized or oppressed. And they were concerned about issues around racism and also issues around sexism and issues around LGBTQ issues and a variety of ways, immigrants, refugees, a variety of ways in which human beings in this country um, were not being honored as fully human. And so the Presbytery of Arkansas really asked there to be a committee to write a new confession that would focus on that question. And then finally, the Synod of the Northeast, so in New England, um, brought an action with raising some similar concerns, right? Um, white supremacy and racism also named in their list of concerns, LGBTQIA plus issues, gender discrimination. They also named ableism, issues around um, uh, intellectual and physical um, um, disability, xenophobia, corporate capitalism, they named, marketing of fear, abuse of power. These are all things that this action named as needing attention. So that's just to show you, right, that you don't form a confessional committee out of nowhere. You form it, the church forms it out of particular concerns that have been identified. And the General Assembly in 22 agreed, these are worthy concerns. And so we're going to establish a committee 
And so that was the committee that was formed just last year in 2023. Um, and that's the committee on which I am also now serving. So, um, whoops, go back. So these um, um, are the questions that are before us um, as a committee. Um, what, first of all, what is the prompting reason for us to write a new confession now? What is the status confessionis, right? What are the issues? The, these three actions that were sent to us have begun to name those, but as a committee, we now have to decide that ourselves just to discern how would we state what is it that's at stake? How is the gospel being threatened in our particular time and place in such a way that we need to speak out? Um, and then there are questions about genre. If we write a new confession, what genre should it be? Because if you look at the book of confessions, you'll see some of them are more liturgically oriented, like the brief statement of faith. Some of them are more um, educationally oriented, the catechisms, for example, right, from Westminster. Um, so there's a question about how, what should this look like? What is the genre? And then what is the content that we need to have? What, what does it need to say? What does it actually need to say. And then there is this further question about what should be its relationship to the existing confessions. Um, because the brief statement of faith, as you may have heard from Joanna last week, in a variety of ways explicitly is in conversation with the earlier confessions. Um, that was a very self-conscious decision that they made. Is that something that we still need to do? And if so, how do we do that? That's, a, that's another um, question that we have to answer. And so this is where I'm going to leave you. Um, what I really wonder, and it's 1047, so I'm afraid we don't have time to really answer it, but, but I, I do wonder just quickly if you would say to this, what, what you would say to that first question, what do you think are the issues now, today, that the church needs to speak to? Please. I assume there have been times in the past where other overtures have been filed but didn't get off the ground to, to, write, a new to write a new confession. And why was that? That's a great question. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to think historically. Um, there have been movements, yes, a few years ago, actually, there was a movement to uh, that proposed that we adopt uh, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail as a new confession. And that did not succeed. Um, I wasn't present at that General Assembly, but I think the issues had to do, number one, with the genre. Uh, you know, is that really, does that fit well into a book of confessions? I mean, it's a really important historical document, and it's something we need to pay attention to, but is that really a confession? Um, so I think that was perhaps the big, and also it wasn't written now, I think, so I think there was a, there has for some time been a concern, uh, at least in the past decade, a concern that we needed a confession from the U.S. that addressed the issue of racism. So Belhar addresses that in the South African context, but we don't have anything in the U.S. since 1967 that addresses the issue of racism. So that there has been growing, I think, for some time, a concern that that needed to be addressed. But but that's an example of a specific recommendation that came that didn't that didn't make it. Yeah, Donna. What each of those overtures that have come, it seems to me they have, this, what it's addressing is the denial of the full humanity of every human being. Yeah, I think that does seem to be a common, yeah. And I agree with that. So you think that's right? I do, I think those are the issues. follow-up question, and this is for Velma or anybody. So if that is, if that's a key issue that is before us, then how would you begin to address that? Like, what do you think needs to be said from the Christian faith to address that? Velma, I'm going to hand it back to you if you have an answer or if anybody else wants to answer. Maybe I'd go back to Genesis okay. and, uh, well, we are all created in the image of God. Every human being is created in the image of God. And any denial of that is a denial of the gospel. Yeah. Thank you. And I think, I think what you're naming there is something that is emerging, uh, yeah, for the committee as well. And it's very helpful to have you sort of echo that same thing. What do you think? 
Well, well, it's a bigger picture question is this book of confessions, are they all coexisting? I mean, is the book saying this is just the history of it or is it saying these all live nice together or does the new one kick out the validity of the older ones? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so the question about what's the relationship, I mean, that's that it's related to that last question here, right? What's the relationship of this, uh, a new confession to the existing ones? But let me show you, let me just go back and remind us of the language that governs this here. Um, we're not, we're not going to be changing this book of order language. So whatever this confession says needs to satisfy these things that are said about confessions in general, right? So, for example, in these statements, the church declares to its members and to the world who and what it is, what it believes, and what it resolves to do. That's true of all the confessions. Um, they are subordinate to scriptures, but they are nonetheless standards. They are not lightly drawn up or subscribed to, nor may they be ignored or dismissed. The church is prepared to instruct, counsel with, or even to discipline one ordained who seriously rejects the faith. So that so that's true of all of the confessions. And this confession that we are um, undertaking to write now will need to fit those same standards until such a time as the Book of Order itself is revised. So, I mean, they are, this is one of the trickiest questions, and when I teach um, students about the confessions at Columbia, it, it's important I've, to, to say they are historical documents, so particularly when we look at the 16th and 17th century confessions, we recognize that they are situated historically. We don't necessarily subscribe to everything that they say, but we still regard them as having wisdom, not just historical wisdom, but theological wisdom that we need to pay attention to and be guided by. So, it's, but that's an ongoing question. Um, Velma, this is going to be the last question, and then I'm going to let you all go because I know we're right up against worship. I, I do think some, it is important, even though I have said, made the general statement of every human being is created in the image of God, but you ha we have to name the issues. It's racism. It's, it's, it's attacking people on gender and LGBTQ and all of those things. I think it needs to be named, 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 and so that it doesn't get glossed over. And also, have you come up with a title, or will that be at the end? Oh, I thought you had one. No. Oh, 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 no, we don't have a title. <laughs> no, we we do not have a title. We are we are the we are the uh, committee that is established to write a new confession. And that's all we are right now, and so we'll figure it out. But um, I just want to affirm your, what you're naming there as the question um, about as the importance of naming the particularity of the issues, and to say one of the things that we're going to have to resolve eventually is how general to be and how specific to be, because we do need to name the issues, and we want to we want to be careful not to be so time bound that the way we say something is irrelevant 10 years from now. Right. And so that's, that's, that's one of the tricky things that we have to figure out along the way, but thank you. Thanks to you all for being here. And, um, I look forward to seeing you again.